Welcome back everyone to my lecture series on PDEs. In today's video we're going to begin solving the 1D diffusion or heat equation using a technique called separation of variables. Separation of variables is one of the most common techniques used for solving PDEs, especially those which apply over a finite domain. It's important to keep in mind though that separation of variables only applies in certain situations. In other words, we need to satisfy certain conditions in order for us to use separation of variables. I'm going to list these conditions right here. The first is that the PDE must be linear and homogeneous, and by linear I mean linear in the dependent variable, so in the function you want to solve for. Note that we're allowing the PDE to have non-constant coefficients, as long as it's linear. The second condition is that the boundary conditions have to be linear and homogeneous, so for example, these two boundary conditions, which are the most general ones possible, one boundary condition at x equals 0 and the other at x equals L, where alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are all constants, these two boundary conditions, because they both equal 0, satisfy the linear and homogeneous requirement. Now that we've gone over the requirements behind using separation of variables, let's go over how separation of variables actually works particularly in the context of a 1D heat or diffusion problem. Suppose we have a really simple diffusion PDE problem. The PDE we have is the same 1D diffusion equation you're hopefully used to seeing by now. Di u di t equals the second derivative of u with respect to x. These are the two boundary conditions in which u is 0 at both ends of the domain, so if you recall these are Dirichlet boundary conditions, and this is the initial condition in which the function u at time 0 is some arbitrary function of x. Let's call it phi. Note that in this PDE problem, both the differential equation and the boundary conditions are linear and homogeneous, which means that it is indeed possible to use separation of variables, as per the conditions I listed earlier. In separation of variables, what we do is we assume that our function u can be separated into a product of two functions one of which is exclusively a function of x, while the other is exclusively a function of t. However, this separable solution isn't exactly unique, because there are infinitely many of these solutions that satisfy the PDE and the boundary conditions. So we could simply write each of these individual solutions using a subscript n as an index. Because our PDE and boundary conditions are linear, we can say that any linear combination of these individual solutions would also be a valid solution. So the most general possible solution we can come up with is u equals the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a n times x sub n of x times t sub n of t, where the a n's are just coefficients. Now you might wonder if any linear combination of these solutions works in terms of satisfying the PDE and the boundary conditions, how is our solution even meaningful and unique? After all, I could use whatever I want for these coefficient values, I could use whatever I want for the ANs, and come up with something that properly satisfies the PDE and the boundary conditions. Well, although I could come up with infinitely many linear combinations that would work in terms of obeying the PDE and the boundary conditions, there is only one linear combination with a particular set of coefficients that satisfies the initial condition. So this initial condition really ensures that we end up with a unique linear combination, and thus a meaningful solution. Since we now know what we're doing, we can go ahead and solve the PDE. To do this, we'll need to substitute our separable solution into the PDE, so we'll need its time derivative and its second spatial derivative. If we differentiate u with respect to t, then the function capital X only contains terms in small x, so for the partial derivative in time, we can just treat it as a constant. So the derivative of u with respect to t is just capital X times the time derivative of capital T. Notice how this is an ordinary derivative now, and it's because the function capital T is only a function of time, so not any other variables. The same logic can be applied to the second partial derivative of u with respect to x, and we end up with t times the second derivative of capital X with respect to small x. Note that because we're differentiating with respect to x now, capital T gets treated as a constant in the partial differentiation. Let's plug this into our PDE, and if we do that, we'll get something like x times dt by dt equals t times the second derivative of capital X with respect to small x. 
And this is where the idea of separating variables comes in. We'll now put all the terms containing time on one side and all the terms containing position on the other side. So effectively dividing both sides by capital X and then dividing both sides by capital T. Now this is where we have to be a bit clever. The left side is only a function of time t, while the right side is only a function of position x. Now if I change time, then my capital T, which is also a function of time, that could change, and so could its derivative. However, changing time doesn't change anything on the right-hand side because there's nothing there which is time-dependent. So even though the individual terms on the left, as in the t and the dt by dt, even though those individual terms might change, their combination overall doesn't change because the combination has to equal the right-hand side, which is constant in time, because there's only position on the right-hand side. Similarly, if I change the position x, then the left side of the equation has to stay constant because there's no x there, which means that the right-hand side, as a result, must also remain constant. So changing either x or t doesn't affect either half of the equation, so we say that both halves are constant. You can prove this to yourself by taking the derivatives of either side with respect to x and t to show that the whole equation actually does equal a constant. The problem now is that we don't know what this constant is. Specifically, do we pick a negative constant, a positive constant, or a zero constant? I'm going to actually show you, using the process of elimination, that the constant is negative. However, I'll add one thing. It's only negative in this particular problem. It doesn't always have to be negative. The only way to tell the sign of the constant is to either use the process of elimination or go back to your problem and check whether the sign of that constant is physically possible. So let's start by choosing a positive constant. If we do that, we can write our constant as lambda squared, since squaring any real number lambda will always give you a positive value, which means our separated differential equation will look something like this. We can break up this expression into two separate ordinary differential equations, one in terms of t and the other in terms of x. If we rearrange the equation in t, we'll get dt by dt equals lambda squared times capital T, which means that capital T is just an exponential function of time, where I've used a here to denote the integration constant. Similarly, for the ODE involving x, we have the second derivative of capital X with respect to small x minus lambda squared times capital X equals zero, which means that we can use the very basic rules you learned back in your ODEs class and write our solution capital X as b cosine of lambda x plus c cinch of lambda x, where b and c again are arbitrary integration constants. Because the solution to our overall PDE is the product of capital T and capital X, which is what we said at the start when we began separation of variables, we can write u down as a times the exponential of lambda squared times t multiplied by b times cosine of lambda x plus c times cinch of lambda x. But here's the problem with this equation. As we let time approach infinity, the solution blows up if b and c aren't both zero. This doesn't make any sense because we expect quantities like temperature and concentration to equilibrate with their surroundings instead of ramping up to obscene levels. And that's why we reject the case where the constant is positive because the solutions would blow up. Now let's look at the case where the constant is zero. If we do that, our separated differential equation will look something like this. Once again, we can break up this expression into two separate ordinary differential equations, one in terms of t and the other in terms of x. If we rearrange the equation in t, we'll get dt by dt equals zero, which means that capital T is just a constant. For the ODE involving x, we have the second derivative of capital X with respect to small x is zero, which means we can write our solution capital X as a linear function. Because the solution to our overall PDE is the product of capital T and capital X, we can write u down as a times bx plus c. But this equation also has a problem, although we might not notice it immediately. In the problem we're solving, we specify two boundary conditions up here. 
So at both x equals 0 and x equals L, u is 0. Let's use these boundary conditions in the expression for u to find the values for our constants. At x equals 0, u is 0, which means that a times c is 0. And at x equals L, u is also 0, which means that a times b times L is 0. However, L is a non-zero number and represents the length of the finite domain. So that means that a times b is also 0. But since a, b, and a, c are both 0, we can conclude that the whole function u is just 0. And so we have a trivial solution when we set our lambda constant equal to 0. But we don't like trivial solutions because they're kind of obvious and don't add anything to our understanding. Additionally, if we have a trivial solution for all x and all t, then there's really no way for us to satisfy what could be a non-trivial initial condition at time 0. So we reject this case as well. Which means that the only possibility we're left with is that we have a negative constant. But since I've already dragged this video on long enough, I'll leave that to the next video.